in, in the program, the first thing that we're going to do today is kind of talk through the kind of legal and political and ethical um, opportunities and challenges and tools that, that we can use when we're figuring out how to do this kind of sense of journalism that we're all talking about. We've changed a couple of things in the afternoon. We're going to compress it down so that we all kind of get an early leave. Um, but we, we still want to kind of have those conversations about what the, uh, what the big opportunities are from a breaking news perspective and an and a investigative journalism um, perspective. Um, but we're going to do it a little bit differently. Um, after this panel, Taylor and I will kind of step you through exa exactly how that will work. Uh, I'll let uh, Emily Bell, the director of the Tau Centre, introduce, introduce our panellists, um, and we'll kick off. Great. Um, thanks very much indeed, uh, Fergus. And to, just to echo what Fergus said, I'm uh, thrilled to see you all here uh, again today. Um, I went to the Yankees and the Red Sox last night, so it's quite surprising I'm here today. Um, uh, this panel... Um, and I apologise for the kind of setup. When you come back next year, which I really hope you will, because we should have a wrap at the end of this, we will be downstairs in a fabulous, properly digital space. It always feels here that you're kind of addressing some kind of 19th century um, public meeting. Um, but we thought this panel was uh, really sort of an important linchpin in, in, in the proceedings because uh, for all the kind of excitement and possibility that we're looking at uh, in terms of these new um, systems of reporting and collecting data, there are ethical, technical, and legal questions. Um, and most journalists are just getting, even, not even really thinking about technology yet, let alone thinking about the framework. So I'm really thrilled that we've got three panelists here who are um, uh, probably sort of some, some of the best people uh, in, in the world to sort of t talk about this. Um, to my immediate left, uh, I've got um, Joanne uh, Gabronovitz, who's the director of the Remote Sensing Lab um, uh, in the University of uh, Mississippi Law School, which is when I was at law school, I spent a lot of time talking about who was responsible if your chariot overturned and your bees escaped. And they s <laughs> so these... these these things have changed, I, I yeah, hear. Today you sue the bees. Today you sue the bees, exactly. That's, that would have made things so much easier, can I just tell you. I also know how to manumit, um, I know how to manumit Roman slaves in the market square as well. It was a very useful course. Um, next to Joanne, uh, we have uh, Robert or Rommel Lefkowitz, who uh, is CTO at uh, a brand new startup called ShareWave. Um, and he's also an author for O'Reilly um, uh, and is negotiating a lot of these, these questions both as, a, a, as an author but now also as a, as a practitioner. And he's hired one of our dual degree students, which I'm very excited about. Um, uh, and to my far left, uh, though only physically, uh, Cord Davis, who's the co-author of um, The Ethics of Big Data, uh, which is also now out in O'Reilly Press. We can have a different conversation about O'Reilly's um, monopolistic position in this <laughs> later. Um, so, so I wanted to sort of just kick off, um, Cord, if it's okay, I'll sort of go, go, go to you first. Um, just on uh, the first part of the panel, just to talk about sort of reflections on, on, on yesterday. Um, and how you're sort of, what it's made you think in terms of, you know, the, 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 the framework and the, and the ethics of, of what we're talking about. Absolutely. You have something prepared, I, I do. see. Yes. Um, just a few remarks. Um, thank you. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Uh, thanks for coming back. Um, I've, this was great yesterday. Um, was been thinking about big data and ethics is as you might imagine, somewhat of a lonely pursuit sometimes, and so it's been nice to have everybody uh, be immediately interested in and curious about and uh, mentioning, um, you know, without any sort of prompting uh, some of the ethical issues and questions that they might have. Um, I wanted to tell really quickly the origin story for how we got onto the topic and how um, O'Reilly decided to move ahead with it. So in my day job, I do a lot of digital strategy and, and other kinds of um, design thinking and visual thinking um, facilitation and uh, consulting with organizations, and a lot of whom are starting to use big data in building their business models and um, products and services. And one of the things that I noticed that would happen a lot is we would be in working meetings, much like some of the breakout sessions we had yesterday, 
and there would be a technologist in the room and a product marketing person in the room and a product designer or manager in the room and, and the technologist would say something like, oh, we can do this with our data now. It's pretty cool. Um, our Hadoop cluster allows us to get, you know, query faster and get results faster and, you know, we can cross-correlate and it's disaggregated and so on and so forth. And one of the product marketing people would go, whoa, that is awesome. Our customers are going to love that. And the second marketing person would go, yeah, but that's kind of creepy, isn't it? And the first marketing person would go, no, I don't think it is creepy. And the second marketing person would go, yeah, no, that's creepy. And they would go back and forth and back and forth <laughs> until you finally realize that this, this discussion was going to not go anywhere. And what I realized after experiencing and watching this um, more than a few times is that in the absence of a common vocabulary and framework, for talking about our ethical positions in business environments, everybody reverts to their own moral code. And our own moral code is a great place to start. That's where we start with all of our values and what we believe in. But unless and until we have a, an understanding and an ability to explicitly express what our common and shared values are in the context of any enterprise, whether it's business, for-profit, non-profit, in a legal sense, anything, then we aren't going to be able to have a productive ethical discussion about what we should and what we shouldn't do relative to our data. Um, so I ended up in having a conversation about that with an O'Reilly editor who immediately said, you should propose a book on that. So I did it. It was great. And Julie helped out a lot with that. So thank you publicly. My first chance to do that. A uh, couple of things I heard yesterday that were interesting to me. Um, uh, quite a few of you regardless of whether you come from the technology perspective or the journalistic perspective, make this distinction between there being uh, personal value in uh, participating in sensor uh, data collection and sort of collective value. So I heard a number of times about this distinction between um, it raining on people's lawns and making uh, sensor data directly relevant to you as an individual, but also that in the aggregate, the collection of that data and the participation in the sensor deployment or management or, or what have you, uh, that there is also some sort of collective value for that. And I would suggest that ethics can mirror that approach or that framework in quite the same way, which is in any individual instance in which your organization or you as an individual even are making a business or a technology or a legal decision based on your values, you're going to have to, or at least want to, I suspect, be in alignment with whatever those values are. Your actions, are, are you, you're going to want to feel good about those things. But you're also going to want to understand that there's a collective value and that you and I share those things as members of a similar enterprise. So you might think about that a little bit. Um, I think one of the best examples there was um, in the Amazon and the Amazonian example, this notion of uh, a collection of geocoded data and it impinging or laying over indigenous population rights. So in the context of the data collection and aggregation and the use and analyzation of that data, we don't really know what the impact of that might be for any larger group, especially if they have a different culture, a different set of values, different all sorts of things. And understanding that distinction between what the individual um, motivations and values are and what the collective um, uh, values are is, is, is an important aspect of that conversation. Mm -hmm. um, just a couple more things here. Um, I also heard yesterday, I heard this enough that I wrote it down, and I'm not sure where this comes from, and this might be good to chat about mm -hmm. later in the panel. Um, I heard a lot of people, especially from the technology perspective, or people who have engaged in just a few collaborative um, in um, initiatives with other organizations. Um, we hope to work with this organization or this type of organization. And then I heard this a lot. I heard, and hopefully some journalists too. And so that's just sort of an open question as to what that degree of engagement is and how we get that um, greater sense of collaboration between all of the different roles, all of the different organizations. We had a little bit of a conversation about that in my breakout group yesterday. Realizing it's a very complex ecosystem and landscape, which I'll talk about directly, directly influences the complexity of the ethical issues that are involved. So um, another quick point. Uh, everybody, I think, intuitively, if not explicitly, is aware of this fact that the pace of the technology advancement far outpaces our legislative uh, agenda. 
and that the increasing size of the gap between what we can do with the technology and what we're allowed to do either legally or not, in, in, especially in any particular geography. We talk, uh, there was the example of it being illegal to take a picture from a drone of a property in Texas. Um, the, uh, the, the increasing size of that gap represents risks for your initiative and your organization. And so understanding where, you know, the, the sort of tagline I came up with for that is, it's always possible to act in accordance with your values, but it's never possible to act in accordance with a law that doesn't exist yet. So there's a, if I, there's a Venn diagram there that you can imagine in your head that there's an overlap between what you might want to follow along in terms of understanding, and I'll talk about this more in a second, but um, understand what the sort of short and near-term legislative trends are that are going to change that landscape in the future and how that might influence what you actually choose to do relative to what your identified values are. Uh, we'll come, probably, we'll come back to that because in a minute yeah, I, want to, I want to ask Jan about what, what, are, what, are the, what is the existing framework and then where do we actually see that going. Yep. Um, just at that point, if I, because it's a, you said a couple of things there which it's a good moment to flip to um, uh, Rommel here who was, said he had, sure. earlier said he had three observations but also do kind of, you know, interrogate each other yeah, on these absolutely. because I'm I'm hearing some sort of similar things, but also some things where you're possibly possibly different. So I don't know whether Robin, you want to pick up on something ethical. Um, well, you know, I'm sort of sandwiched between two experts. You know, <laughs> uh, and I and I don't I don't I'm not an expert in anything. Uh, so what I do is I try to uh, rephrase the question so that it's an easier question that anybody can answer. Um, and, and so, you know, in listening to, to what was going on yesterday, I had the, the you know, three observations in terms of, you know, how to, how to frame the discussion. The, the first uh, just being <clears throat> that when, when you start talking about law and ethics to a crowd of people who are interested in data and data collection, um, it's kind of an interesting um, uh, cognitive dissonance in that <clears throat> the ethics and the law are pretty much always about ignoring any data. Um, in fact, you start from a position that you sort of have this principle, and uh, the research shows that if data is collected that challenges the principle, you cling to it. The more data you see that, that invalidates the principle, the tighter you cling to it. And that, that's sort of the feature of ethics. <clears throat> uh, so anyway, the, the question that arose or, um, um, yesterday, somebody mentioned, was that the most important question was who owns the data? sort of the question of the age, and, and, I, and I think that's, a, that's an unfortunate way of phrasing the question, because then we focus on sort of all the wrong things. Um, sort of like phrasing the abortion debate around, you know, who owns the fetus, right? It, 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 if you phrase it that way, you sort of go down, go down a different set of, of uh, frameworks than, than if you had phrased it differently. Um, where the ethical framework and legal frameworks around data have been, has traditionally have been around how it is collected, right? So if you, you think about, uh, you know, medical records, right? And, and as an example, you know, you want to do a, a story around pregnancy, you know, rates in Manhattan. So you want to know who's pregnant. And, and it could be cancer rates. It could be, you know, any, any medical fact. Um, and if you called up a doctor and said, could you give me a list of your patients because I want to find out who's pregnant or not? And they'd say, well, that's unethical. Right, but if you called everybody's house and you said, excuse me, you know, is there a pregnant woman in this house? Um, and they told you, then that, that would be fine. Um, but then you, you can start, so, so, so the difficulty with who owns the data is, what do we, you know, what's the data that we're talking about owning here? Is it, is it the fact that somebody might or might not be pregnant? And then you sort of start playing with this. It's like, well, supposing then you called somebody and they said, you know, is anybody pregnant? They said, it's none of your business and hang up on you. And then you call the neighbors and you say, is anybody pregnant there? And, oh, by the way, are your neighbors pregnant? And they tell you, right? Because then you might be able to find out. Or because this is a, we're talking about sensor journalism. Supposing we build a sensor, we have smart dust that, that from pheromones can tell from five feet away whether the person passing by might be pregnant or not and how far along she might be. And I collect the data that way and I cross reference it with, I don't know, cell and GPS data or you know, check ins uh, on Twitter. And voila, I, can, I know who, you know, I, I can build a map. That way, and is that so? So, in, in all of these things, the, the the information about pregnancy or cancer or you know whatever medical information you're collecting, the information itself 
is not the issue. It's how you went about collecting it. And so, for, so that's kind of the right place to have the, the debate. Um, and th this actually came to light a couple of years ago. There was a, sort of a famous uh, case at uh, Target had uh, identified or some was sending out coupons to, to pregnant women and, and some father wanted to sue because his, his underage daughter was getting these coupons for things. And, and of course, the, the embarrassment in his case was, you know, Target was right and, and he, was, he didn't know that she, she had gotten pregnant. And, and again, it's a, you know, if you, if you, if you buy a, a, a pregnancy kit and then a couple weeks later you buy certain vitamins, they can infer, you know, without any, you know, is that ethical or not, or should there be laws about that kind of a thing or not? Anyway, um, and then <clears throat> lastly, the, the other observation about it's sort of defining censored journalism, which we did not do um, very crisply, so sort of where are the boundaries of what censored journalism versus what stated journalism uh, or whatnot, because <clears throat> if we wanted to pick, and this might be a good thought experiment, what is the sort of the poster child for, for censored journalism? Yeah, the, the, the most popular story for censored journalism of the last year, um, one candidate, I would argue, would be the cicada tracker. And that's, you know, and that's a feel-good story, and it's great participation and involvement, and uh, one can sort of see the, the, the benefits. Um, but I would argue that the, probably the most popular story was uh, uh, Anne Hathaway. Um, story in that, you know, cameras are sensors, and so paparazzi are, are sort of the, the ancient art of censored journalism, and that seems less high-minded, um, and... This is not her haircut story either, is it? This is like a different... No, this, this is, is, this is a wardrobe story. Right. <laughs> Just checking. <laughs> um, and... Um, so you know, to the extent that we say censored journalism is really about collecting environmental data, then the issues are fairly clear. To the extent that it's about collecting personal information, then they're not so clear. Um, and so we can make the problem simpler by just saying censored journalism is really about collecting meteorological data, which is a lot of the projects that we heard, and then therefore there are very few ethical or legal issues. But if we choose to include individual personal information, then you know, we, we've opened a different can of worms. So. Can, we can define the question to be easy or hard. John, help us out here, which is uh, what, are, what, are, what are the existing ethical codes and, and laws that sense journalists should be paying attention to or finding out about? It, it's the Wild West. It really is, because the law is um, reactive by nature. And we want a system in the, and I'm only going to talk about the Anglo-American system because that's the one I know, but um, the law is conservative, small c. And uh, courts don't go around looking for problems to solve. We have to go to a court if we have a conflict. And that's what I mean by being reactionary. So uh, we have a series of laws that are often based on something that happened. The one you're probably familiar with is the um, protection of uh, electronic records for uh, uh, renting movie films from film stores because when Justice Bork was nominated to the Supreme Court, um, he was asked about what kind of movies he would watch in his spare time, and his uh, uh, detractors were hoping to paint a fairly purient picture of him. And so they went and got uh, the list of movies he rented from the video store. And the American public was so appalled, regardless of what side of the political fence you are, about that kind of intrusion, we have the Video Rental Records Protection Act. It's very specific and very narrow because there was a real event uh, that catalyzed it. In remote sensing, we do have a national federal statute, the Land Remote Sensing Policy Act of 1992, which repealed the 1984 Land Remote Sensing Commercialization Act. And what catalyzed that was the commercialization of declassified spy satellites, in effect. That's, that's what it was. And when a technology becomes mature enough to be uh, commercialized, then we tend to start to see uh, uh, laws being made. Um, what we're seeing now with data that Google gathers and collects is um, they're reacting. They're, they're 
their stance, Facebook's stance. Facebook doesn't have uh, a privacy policy, by the way, anymore. It's called a data use policy. They're not, they're not even pretending <laughs> that it, they're protecting anybody's privacy. And uh, what, what we see with Google is they basically go out, grab any data they can find anywhere, any place, any time, ingest it. It's the big data sucking monster. They bring it in. And they have done a number of things that have caused reactions. So their first uh, iteration of Street View, mm -hmm. um, they went around collecting pictures of uh, street level scenes. And um, <laughs> my favorite story is that a guy was walking down the street and uh, they got his picture and he happened to be with his mistress. And his wife saw it on Google and said, who's that woman? And he said, oops. And so he sued Google for invasion of privacy, even though he was in the street. And that's another thing, is the whole idea of public and private spaces is being turned on its head. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, depending on what happens, we see reactions. So the most recent thing Google is doing now is uh, they're receiving requests from people not to use my images, and they're pixelating them. Whereas, um, you know, they weren't even doing, telling people what they were doing anymore. Now they seem to be reacting when somebody is asking them to. And the fact is that um, they pixelated or obfuscated images of the White House because the State Department asked them to. And so it's a very selective Wild West thing where I think from a legal perspective, you would start out with the presumption of openness because we're the people who invented the First Amendment. We tend to like that kind of thing. Uh, and then we're seeing the e exceptions being made. Uh, regarding, so, so it's a very patchwork thing. Um, and I can't give you a lot of comfort. Uh, regarding yesterday, the most important thing I heard yesterday was in one of the morning presentations, I think it was the speaker from Reuters, I'm not positive of that, where he said, you have to rely on experts to read your sensor data. Don't do it yourself. And I will underline that 17 times because uh, reading, for example, a remotely sensed image is less a science and more an art. And there are people who have been working at it for a very, very, very long time. And there is a consensus that has been um, reached about how you do that. It's a, it's a difficult thing. And so um, you really do need to rely on the people who know what they're talking about. If you don't do that, you're going to create a chilling effect on what you do. People will see you using sensors, and you become part of the problem. If all you're doing is giving some kind of ad hoc but well-meaning uh, interpretation, and I think that's incredibly important now because the public has become more and more aware of all the technologies that are tracking them, their cell phones, their browsers, all sorts of things. And the, uh, that's why drones have taken off as an issue huge time because um, people are starting to realize that they're being tracked. Um, RFID chips in Walmart and other things, all these things, there, there's a, a, an aggregation of awareness that we're seeing play out in the drone issue, that people are realizing that unbeknownst to them, they have been tracked, data is being gathered about uh, their uses of these technologies, and we're starting to feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. The other thing is the Supreme Court has started to notice this. So uh, last year we had a very, very important case, you, the United States versus Smith, where Mr. Smith was not the kind of person you would want your daughter to date. He was a drug dealer, he was a nasty man, and uh, he was being surveilled by the Washington, D.C. authorities. They went to a court and they asked for a search warrant and they wanted to put a GPS unit on Mr. Smith's car. Um, so they got a search warrant that said, yes, you can put it on Mr. S and that is his name, Smith. I'm not <laughs> you know, doing this. Uh, <laughs> so they, they uh, got a search warrant that said they could put the GPS unit on the car. 
Uh, they identified his vehicle, and there was a time limit. There was like three weeks in which the authorities could place the GPS unit on the car. Well, they put it on Mr. Sw Smith's wife's car, and it was beyond the time period of the warrant. So Mr. Smith's attorney argued it was a warrantless search and therefore should not be upheld. And what the police argued first was, well, it is a warrantless search. That was a fruitless argument. But then, and this is the interesting part, they went on to say, this is not a search anyway. We are tracking. We are not searching. And the, the Constitution allows tracking. Mm -hmm. And the court went, hmm. And um, when they came out, you read, now this is a court that does not agree on anything. Everything is 5-4, one way or the other. <laughs> Here, everybody agreed that it was a search, but they all agreed for different reasons. And the way I read the case is, it's kind of like the justices looked at it and went, hmm. We, Fourth Amendment, 18th century language. GPS, 21st century technology. Well, if it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's a duck. It's a search. And the, the reason, uh, the plurality reason that they gave was uh, something along the lines you were saying, is if you have a GPS unit and uh, Mr. Smith uh, drops off his kids at daycare, then goes to the drugstore, then goes to a psychiatrist, and then goes to a divorce lawyer, you can start putting things together and say, Mr. Smith's life is in a crisis right now. And so th they called it a mosaic approach to information. And this is a long way of saying that people are becoming aware of senses both in the public and in the law. Um, the other thing I want to stress, as a non-journalist and as somebody who has had to learn remote sensing tech, my degrees are in history, literature, and law. So learning about technology has always been the most challenging part of, uh, uh, rewarding part of, of what I do. Um, so I have to tell you, as an informed person, it is, I think it's very important for you to know data is not information. Data is data and it gets sliced and diced and chopped and interpreted, and that is where you fall into problems. And a few years ago, there was a uh, policy analyst when the uh, commercial uh, remote sensing companies first came online. These were the companies that are using declassified spy satellites, high resolution. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to show how useful this data was, and so he bought himself some imagery, uh, this is about 12, 13 years ago. He bought himself some imagery. He quickly analyzed it, and he put it online and said, there are missiles in North Korea. And what got him in trouble is not whether or not there were missiles in North Korea, but the way he analyzed it was so quick, was so fast, and he reached conclusion so quickly that the imagery community said, how could you do that? So this is a new data source. We even have to play with it first before we do it. He got fired, he lost his job, and nobody cared whether there were missiles in North Korea or not because the so-called image activist behaved in such a way that he became the issue rather than the missiles in North Korea. And I think we're a little bit past that now, but I, depending on what you are sensing, what you're looking at, I think it's important uh, to remember that. And then the let could, could I interrupt sure. just to, before we get too far away from Mr. Smith, because you're talking about the GPS tracking right. of Mr. Smith. Um, and although the court agreed on that particular issue, I think in general, and if you could comment, um, things that happen in cyberspace mm -hmm. are not considered, you know, part of your domicile, so so they can be sort of searched willy-nilly by the government in that, you know, because because it's not a search in 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 that context. And if I have a that's an is that, uh, that's an open question. In fact, the ACLU is working its way through the courts right now, using data from cell phone towers, mm -hmm. and they are uh, the police have gotten very sophisticated. They know 
what they need a warrant for and what they don't need a warrant for, and they know the part in between which has not been answered. So, for example, if they want to monitor your phone, they know they have to get a warrant for that. But what if they go to the phone company and say, give me a data dump for all the data that passed through that cell tower on from this date to that date. We'll be happy to sift through the data. That they don't need a warrant for, although the ACLU is challenging that. So this is what I mean by about the Wild West. There are a lot of pending questions and for which there's no answers. It's also, and it's also fair to say that, um, which I, I, I sometimes get in trouble for saying in a journalism school, particularly as a British journalist, um, that you know the, 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 the job of the journalist is not always to uphold the law, right. um, but to work within legal frameworks. <laughs> this is the sharp intake of breath. Well, you know, kind of like if it depends. It's a very Amerocentric view of the world that says, you know, kind of everything, every, everything, everything the government does is right, and therefore you must always stick to the law, and uh, the law is always right, as opposed to the public interest. So, mm -hmm. you know, often journalists are working within, you know, a, an ethical framework, hopefully, and sometimes not within an ethical yes, framework, so as we know. So, question, yeah. actually, you know, back to the topic at hand. So let's assume for the moment, which I'm going to disagree with, that it's not about ownership, but it's about the collection or the or the methodology by which you acquire that data. Would it follow then in your minds that the ethical and legal implications or framework ought to focus on the collection level of that activity and not the subsequent analysis or codification or storage or usage or whatever happens down the, down the um, data exhaust trail? Well, to some degree, the law already does. That's why the court in the GPS case said, let's look at how this behaves. How is this collected? And they didn't buy that it was tracking. You know, They put all the information together and saw how it was collected. And for that purpose, it, it was a search. Regarding other kinds of collection, you're going to have auxiliary legal issues. For example, physical trespass. If you trespass onto somebody's property to get data, the data is one issue, but trespass is another standalone issue all by itself. Right. So there's going to be concomitant legal issues that do get raised by the collection of the data, but isn't triggered by the data itself. This is actually, I mean, there's a clear ethical question around this, which is especially related to sensor data, uh, which in many cases can be at once removed from your physical presence, whether it's owned by mm. you or the collector, mm. regardless of the device of which it's collected through, which is, if you don't know that I'm violating your privacy, is your privacy actually being violated? Mm. Yep. If a tree falls yes. in the forest. Yeah, well, I yep. mean, it's, you yeah. know, it, but it's not a useless yeah. question. Yeah. No, it's, a, sense, it's, it's a great question. It, and, and sort of actually, look, that leads to a question I was going to put back to you, Cord, which is if you, in, when you're writing your next book, um, and <laughs> imagine it's uh, you know, on the ethics of sense of journalism, wh where would you start that research? You know, is that the question? What, what, what are the right questions now for us to be thinking about? Because yes, yeah, so I would say a couple things real quick about that. One is, I think there's, the, I have this notion, which I call the, Individuals and organizations need to get better at, at maintaining the right perspective in that level of abstraction. You know, a couple of you heard me say yesterday, ethics is a highly abstract topic, but has very real world consequences. And understanding where we're looking at and, and what, what level of detail is going to be most appropriate at either the technology, legal, or ethical level is going to be important. And so uh, there's what I call the microscopic view, which is if you take too narrow a slice of what you're looking at and focus only on, for example, the privacy issues, you might miss the ownership or identity issues. So for example, in many online systems, how an organization technically defines in their database an individual their mm -hmm. identity, mm -hmm. that has a lot to do with what you can even violate their privacy around. Right. So you, know, you don't want to be too microscopic and focused on too narrow a niche of abstraction, I guess. But you also want to, you know, take a little bit of a telescopic view so that you can understand the cultural, legal, social, political changes that are going to inform both the legal, ethical, and, you know, technological decisions that people are going to make. There's this notion that your business processes and technical infrastructure can actually be conceived of as a physical manifestation of your ethical values. 
and the way in which those things operate are constructed by human beings who make decisions on a regular basis. I mean, that's so, a, you're touching on some really interesting um, areas here for journalism because that yeah. idea of what is the digital fourth estate, yeah. you know, has always been thought of as, how, you know, how do you stand how do you stand outside, you know, government and commerce and produce a system of accountability and yeah. reporting back to the public. Yeah. So it, it seems that what you're saying is that there is something within that as well about how journalism Journalism collects, creates so, yeah. so ideas, manages identity. Yeah. So, so, given that sort of setup, um, I used the phrase the wild, wild west a lot as well. And, you know, the, the follow on I use, and there are no Pinkertons yet in, in that world. And so, the, you know, the little anecdote I think of is historically, um, it took Upton Sinclair writing The Jungle for us to create legislation and changes in, in labor structures to fix. Uh, rampant and dangerous conditions, rapid um, corruption and dangerous conditions in the meatpacking industry. It took Rachel Carson writing Silent Spring to do the same for environmental laws. Nobody has yet written the same story for data, and I think that journalism has a great opportunity to do that, telling stories about the human side of what's happening on, you know, both on the receiving end and on the collective end of, of those let data pig, decisions. Let me piggyback on that because I thought about this last night. I think one of the projects the is a tower tow. 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 No, we won't remove your car. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, and, we, and we rhyme with cow. Which is, in fact, we used to have tow cow, which has gone missing. But anyway. the, the tow center might focus on one of its projects is to gather uh, a statement of best practices yeah. because um, everybody recognizes that there are far few, there are precious few answers to all of these questions. Mm -hmm. And everybody knows you're going to make a mistake, meaning the collective uh, yeah. com journalist community. Uh, by having a list of best practices that is brought together mm -hmm. by uh, practicing journalists based on journalistic principles, you can at least be seen to be trying. Mm -hmm. no, but if, if you make a mistake, fine. Fraud we're not going to forgive. And the difference between fraud or Im improper behavior and a mistake can be that statement that I'm trying to do the right thing under the circumstances for something that is a moving target. And so, for example, the American Society for Photogrammetric Engineering and Remote Sensing has a statement of ethics, and I worked with them on that. And it doesn't cover everything, but it's it's a starting point. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and. Mm -hmm. If I understand correctly, journalism does have its own code of professional behavior. Yes. Not, you, not in Britain, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, you guys don't write down your constitution. I mean, that, that's the problem. It's no. a very freeing environment to be in. We, <laughs> we, like, we like case law and, you know, kind of all of that yeah, sort of so, stuff. But so yes, so, yeah, no, so we don't. Write down those, don't uh, write it down. It's, well, obviously, so that's bad the, advice for journalists. The point is being, that you do have a starting point that you can overlay the sense of journalism on. Yeah. And, yeah. And, but, so I would argue that to, to articulate oh. that, right, what you're talking about, the two things that you can talk about are um, how you're going to collect the data and what are you going to do with it once you have it. Right? The, the information, like, and there may be other stuff that you learn along the way, but it's really, you can't really talk about whether or not you're allowed to know certain things. Yeah. Right? Or, so, so really, you know, all that's left is how did you collect it, mm -hmm. and were you deceitful about mm -hmm. collecting? Like, did you did you collect stuff, yeah. um, and, and and then what did you do with it once you yeah. once you figured it out? Yeah. Um, so the tricky part about the collection and the deceit is when you collect information, right? So if you if you if you're just collecting sort of purchases at a at a at a, at a target, you know, or or, or looking at traffic patterns and who's walking, you know, or, or driving past certain areas. Once you have all that, you can infer all kinds of stuff that you didn't set out to go get. So you might have started sort of with all the best intentions to do this completely harmless thing, and then it turns out that you now can discover something com that you did not anticipate that you were going to discover. And, and does the fact that you sort of discovered it serendipitously absolve you, right? Because 
because this is the argument Google can make, right? Well, I was taking pictures of the street. I wasn't expecting to catch anybody's mistress, so, you know, it wasn't mm -hmm. like I, I'm, yeah. I'm blameless because I, yeah. I, 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 was, I was trying to do no wrong. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's the difficulty is it's so, the, it, once you collect data, it's so fungible. And, and I mean, you were talking about um, uh, uh, the way you store the information and not maintaining uh, identifiable information. Well, I mean, what we learned with the AOL release is uh, you don't need that because you can infer it, right? Given 12 browser clicks, you can figure out, on average, you can figure out with 95% accuracy who that person was and, and identify it them. It takes three pieces of data to identify <laughs> any individual, and if you can correlate those across any data right. sets. Right. But, but so if, if, if you look at just browser you know, URL hits, apparently you know, with, with 12, you can figure that out. And let me <laughs> piggyback on that, because you said mm -hmm. something very important before, that the journalist's job is not always to obey the law if the law is improper. I am less concerned about the government use of data than I am about private sector use of data. Because we do have laws in place. We have the Fourth Amendment. We have uh, the Electronic Records Act. We have HIPAA. We, we have all sorts of things. Not perfect, but as a republic, we have dealt with the issue of overbearing government invading privacy of citizens. Now it's citizen to citizen that concerns me more. I was in a Walmart and a young woman who was so happy and bright and had her brand new beautiful baby taking pictures for, for grandma and grandpa, the first thing the, the, the um, clerk asked for was the baby's birthday. They didn't need the birthday, but Walmart's going to track that kid for the rest of its life. And there's no law saying they can't do that. I am really much more concerned. And not only that, it's the private sector that has the cutting edge ability and knowledge to do this. Um, the yeah. government is more restricted in, in many ways, not the least of which is financial. So um, I, I think the real concern about misuse of data uh, mm -hmm. right now is more the private sector mm -hmm. than government. Just, just we, we, sorry, we, yeah. just real quick, we, we've done some work on what I'm calling the creepy quotient. Yes. And our current, and actually, if anybody has any thoughts on this afterwards or, or now, would love to hear. You know, the notion we've been working with is the difference between what you expect to be done with that data and what a, what is actually mm -hmm. eventually done with it. And the farther mm -hmm. along you get in that data exhaust mm -hmm. trail, the mm -hmm. especially with with individual and for pro, pro, for profit corporations mm -hmm. and their technological abilities today, the creepier it becomes. Mm -hmm. And that, and actually, told you bringing it back to journalism as well. I mean, we've had a couple of examples. I guess the the most um, famous recent one was the. Uh, gun ownership data map that was created um, by uh, the um, paper in Westchester, uh, which was taking public information um, widely available, publishing it, uh, and uh, creating an environment. Through, you know, publication is an act which also changes the context yes. of right. data. Yeah. And journalism is often that act, you know, and, and, and how it presents and, and, right, and surfaces. When I, when I register a gun, I don't necessarily expect that to be published. That's one of those acts that yeah. is different than maybe maybe what I might yeah. expect to be actually done. And, and, and ethically, there was nothing wrong with what the uh, there was nothing wrong with what was done. It was more a question of well, you know, kind of the, the if you like the sort of the context was changed, uh, particularly by the kind of heat of the debate around it, yeah. which then allowed some latitude for authorities to say, well, we're not going to release the data in that format anymore. You and, know? and there the issue is you have all level governments, uh, municipal, state, federal, collecting all sorts of data as part of their regular missions. That's what they do. Everything from the census data to uh, road quality. What we have now is technology that aggregates that data. And it's that active aggregation that puts it together that makes it available. Up until um, the time they published, if somebody had the time, effort, and inclination, they could figure it out mm -hmm. too. But now it's so easy, that's what's triggering the concern. Mm -hmm. And in that vein, uh, another Columbia project is the, the declassification engine. Yeah, yeah. So well, which would. So yes. if you if you Backing. have yeah. the ability yeah. to collect yeah. all of these declassified documents and fill in the redactions um, with a large enough corpus, um, 
Yeah, it just reminds me of, the, of, of that line from Sneakers, right? No more secrets, Marty. Right. Um, what do you do when, when the government can't keep secrets, right? Mm. So, so I think, I mean, you're, you are less concerned about the government. Mm. I think the, the backlash is in the other direction, right? What citizen, what, what censor journalism can do is track flights of airplanes, say, and, and publish yes. some secret troop movements yeah. or, or, or... The, rendi the rendition project, the which rendition I, yeah, project I'm, I'm sure everybody here right. has seen, which is an amazing kind of, you know, thing, is uh, um, Fergus, Fergus is waving at me in that ask questions kind of way. Um, uh, it, it's, uh, I'm going to let you all ask questions, but I'm too interested to stop. To, with, <laughs> there's, one more, there's one more question. There's actually one more question, and then everybody can ask questions. Um, because uh, this is not a democracy. Um, See, no written constitution. No written constitution. <laughs> I am the, so this is an I am the, I am the queen in parliament. It's meant to be a powerless totemic, but I've gone crazy, and now you're all in trouble. Um, the, the, just, just sort of before we flip to the audience, the one, the one question was really, um, as we're talking about all this, and we're, and we're talking about it in, and we talked about it yesterday, and because we're all great people doing wonderful projects, it's all in quite a kind of high-minded way. Um, just, what are the, not just in the kind of high-minded and the environmental and the, what we're doing good for society, um, though actually that would be good too, uh, but this sense of like, where, where are the big opportunities? So each of you, none, none of you are running a newsroom. But if each of you were running a newsroom, where would you now be looking for going, right, okay, this is what I would do, yeah. and this is how I do it? I've actually tried to start this work. I'm not a journalist, so I'm, I didn't get very far. I'm very, very interested in the human side of the technology decisions. So as engineers, as developers, as database architects, we're interested in problems, technology, it's in you know, solving particular problems, using technology in a particular way. And I think it's fascinating how those decisions get either abstracted from business values or individual values or shared values in some sense. And, and just exploring what that relationship is between, you know, what I think of as the human side of, of computer science or engineering or database design or, you know, any kind of big data architecture uh, challenge. And, and, you know, like I was saying a minute ago, this notion that um, business processes and technical infrastructure can be viewed in, in one, from one perspective as a physical manifestation of our values and, and just kind of exploring that as a journalistic topic. But okay. I think that would be, I would love to see a, you know, a wired 4,000 word article on that with, you know, direct interviews with people who are, you know, extremely knowledgeable about both sides of that mm -hmm. uh, question. So. Mm -hmm. It's a questions. Hi. Um, I talked about this in our small group yesterday, but I would love to hear kind of the bigger perspective. I've started, I've done two projects now um, that were relatively large. I've done a lot of little ones, but um, one was in Japan. We started a group called SafeCast. It's still working today. I'm not a part of it anymore, but where we give Geiger, Geiger counters to people, we make Geiger counters, we aggregate all this data, we, and it's changed the story dramatically about Fukushima. Um, we, all, we went into it in partnership with Keio University. They have a really great nuclear engineering department. Um, the current project I'm working on, the mapping the mangroves, also is in partnership with Conservation International, which has some of the top mangrove scientists in the world. There's a bridge between journalism and science. Journalists are not scientists because they shouldn't be, right? That's not what they do. Um, but they do have to interpret and they have to work with scientists to do that. My, my question is, is, where's that line, right? If, if I can, as a journalist, go buy a bunch of sensors or have a geek like me make a bunch of sensors and throw them out somewhere mm. and see that there's some toxic outflow from some solid waste dump somewhere, you know, and um, as like Public Lab has done, right, in Brooklyn, the, you know, the veracity of the collection of the data, the, the rigor with which it was manipulated, et cetera, is going to come into question. And, and, and so that line has to be really clear, and I would love to hear more about that, because, you know, we're talking about like sensing in terms of 
existing data, but when you're generating new data, it's a different story. Sure, uh, sure. Let, let me try that because remember me, history, literature, and law? Uh, yeah. Um, the analogy I give my students, they want to know, can I really do remote sensing law? I don't know any science. I don't know any engineering. I said, absolutely. And the analogy I give is uh, an attorney pra uh, practicing medical malpractice law. To do that, you have to know enough medicine to know how to apply the law. And the second thing you have to know is when to call an expert. And so it's the exact same thing. And I think what's really important is you cultivating experts that you can trust and rely on. And the two of you or three of you have enough time to work out your vocabulary. And if you do that, you'll be fine. So I'll, uh, I'll answer by changing the question. Um, and then <laughs> well, answer. You warned us about that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and wh what I would say is, so, so my interpretation of this cicada tracker, to, and I'll bring it back to your question, is that the sensors were, um, were not relevant. Um, the, all the information could have been, well, first of all, if you had a, you could have done it with surface temperature and with a model that could predict it. So you could have done it with, with publicly available meteoro meteorological data and been equally accurate with, with, with a good model. Um, and in terms of the, the data collection, um, you, don't you don't need the sensor collecting sort of real-time data every 10 seconds and whatever. Again, this is a, you could take, you know, a reading once a week and, again, have been close enough. That the, the in what what's distinguishes what we've been talking about, sensor journalism from other kinds, might be, um, well, this doesn't distinguish it. The journalism is not about discovering the science. It's different from science in that it doesn't care about the, the, the facts, the data, if you will. It cares about the engagement, right? The, the, the journalism, if I might, is not, it might be about making people care about the news more than it is about finding out what's, you know, so the scientist cares about finding out, whereas the journalist cares about making people care about it. So what, what was great, you know, awesome about the Cicada Tracker Project is it got people involved, so they were invested, so it built this sort of community and interest around this particular topic. And that's, so if journalism and science are sufficiently distinct, right, what you're approaching is not so much around, you know, the science of learning new things, but about the how do I make people care about it, then you have, a, it's a completely different thing. I mean, I, you know, well, yeah. I think, I think it's, it's the, to, if you want to reframe the question, you know, mm -hmm. I'm not a journalist, and I'm at this conference, right, and the public lab people um, are trained as urban designers, not as journalists. So I think you actually also have to ask the question the other, the other way around. Why is it that journalists are paying attention you know, to all these other ways, it's because not only journalists are making are making the news nowadays. Mm. Yes, I mean, we just, you know, having just authored a report, co-authored co a report where one of the key findings, well, not finding observation is there is no longer such a thing as the press addressing such a thing as the public. Yeah, that, right. um, yeah. you know, the point about how... Well, we were all just people that showed up. Yeah, right? yeah, right. yeah. Right. And, and, and the... And the, the board, yeah. It's called the internet. That's oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think oh, that's a great question. Which is all these partnerships? The, the partnership as, as, with yeah. the experts. Right. Yeah. In my opinion, in the opinion, I think it is. Right. It's Scott. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, Thank you. 
Mm -hmm. So if we had to worry about collecting the data, we wouldn't publish any. So we have a very different set of guidelines, which is which is guided both by a special set of ethics and also the concept of newsworthiness. Yeah, for the record, so, Robert and I haven't gone mano a mano on that yet. <laughs> but I agree, I think there's a I think there's a hierarchy there. But, but, so, th so this is the agency issue. What you're saying is um, uh, it was illegal for him to give you the information, but yeah. you're blameless. But if we're talking about legal and ethical frameworks, then we've just moved the problem to now, you know, Daniel Ellsberg. Mm -hmm. was, was, was what he did illegal or, was, or, or unethical or, or <laughs> you know? And so, so by saying, oh, I'm not going to collect this data. I'm going to give censors to other people and they will collect the data. So therefore, I don't have an ethical <laughs> issue. All you've done is move, right? That's the agency problem of say, uh, there's still an issue. If it, even if it's not yours, now they have to worry about and it. If, and, it <laughs> and if you are, if you are, for instance, you know, a, a, a publisher and you say you're the New York Times and you have live data tracking of somebody or something on your website or through your app or, or whatever, then presumably that is protected by the First Amendment. You know, it, it's, it's, if, isn't it? Well, but also to get back to your point about the government and, yep. and Daniel Ellsberg being the case in point, right? Possibly the issue is that your ethics are at odds with the law. I was just going to say you cannot <laughs> use the terms illegal and unethical interchangeably. No. Because I would argue that what Ellsberg did was clearly illegal, but it was highly ethical, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Right. And the there, there are plenty, so, plenty of yeah. Uh, so I, just a couple of observations and a question. So one is, um, uh, actually, I think 5% of every broadcast is data journalism. It's just called the weather. They're, <laughs> they're using sensors, and they're conveying in a way that's interesting to you and making it relevant. And it's all data journalism. Um, and so uh, there might be something interesting, as boring as we may all think the weather is as a journalism, as a part of journalism, there may be something to learn from the people who do the weather. Can I steal that? Is that that's a good one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, also, also data point that actually the forecasting methods used by, for instance, Nate Silver are pretty much exactly developed along the same modeling lines right. as the weather. And right. as, a, and matter of, oh, as a matter of if law. If someone could do decent weather reporting, I would be in heaven. I spent 10 years at The Guardian saying, can we please have better weather, social <laughs> weather, more up to date? our own weather. Which is um, hilarious because the, the British are obsessed with it. Um, it's a good, it's a so, very good and, and, Yeah, like America isn't. And, and I think, it's, <laughs> and I think it's, it's, and one reason to go there is because um, there is actually something that happens like we're not actually asking people to crowdsource the weather for us. We've totally professionalized it. And so there is like less of a community. There's still people who do it out there, but it gets very different. And also weather, like telling you about the weather is very different than talking about climate change. You can right. try to link the two, but people don't actually care about how the weather was generated. They just want to know, <laughs> is it going to be sunny tomorrow? And so, so it kind of um, those things become kind of, it, it, I think it's worth talking about whether those things are related. And, and so I think there's a rich space And as there. a matter of law, the important part about the point that you're making is if if you have records, like the weather records, that are kept as a matter of course for the purpose of documenting the weather, those are automatically admissible in court. Right. Because the reason they were collected was not to bias one party or the other. The reason why they were collected was to attest to what the weather is. So if you do have s sources of data that you don't have to go through the pedigree or what's called the Daubert test. Uh, you're much better off. And by the way, does there, anybody here know about the Eros Data Center in Sioux Falls, South Dakota? That is where we have all the unclassified satellite data and aerial data going back to the 1930s. And uh, it's a fantastic source of uh, uh, satellite data and aerial data. And they have an online uh, presence and you can look at thumbnails and you can find out what you want and if you're looking for for imagery for a particular day um, they can help you find it so the the, the second observation or question I was going to make is um, I actually do think there is an institution that actually has been grappling with ethics around sensors and data and they're called universities and they have IRBs and uh, they make you go through these very annoying processes to have values and ethics reviews of the research you're going to do <laughs> and um, and so I and, and I think most people I ever talked to who's gone through gone through an IRB find it an enormous pain in the butt um, although they'll often find uh, there's like a glimmer of interesting knowledge they got out of it um, and so one of the questions I have is 
can, do, can journalists learn from IRBs? Um, is there something there? Can they be laid, made more streamlined and easier to do? So I think that that's kind of like there's a rich, there's potentially a rich conversation. I know nothing about it, so I'm, yeah. if it's a completely stupid idea, I'm very open to that. Um, and then the, and the and link to that is I'd love to know from Cord is, um, you say you're, you know, you're consulting with companies and helping them. So similar to the IRB question, who are the companies out there, and you don't have to name them by name, that are doing, like who are doing, like what are their best practices? Who, what are the questions they're asking? What's yeah. the process they have set up internally? Yeah. And can that apply to, to journalists or, or yeah. the rest of us in some interesting way? Okay. I, I can give, uh, yeah, yeah do, I can do you want to do that and I'll come to Matt. Yeah. He's. You know, the, or, the origin of informed consent is from the personal genome project at Harvard Medical School, and what they realized is there is no more uniquely identifiable information about you or data about you, to be more precise, than your DNA. In fact, there is only one string of data about you in the entire universe, so access to that automatically can correlate with any other available data. And what they realized is if you participate in this project, there's absolutely no way that they can prevent for all time to come that they could protect your anonymity and thus your, your genomic data, which could have lots of lots of consequences down the road. So if you participate, you actually have to take a test that you have to get 100 percent on, and you have to take a course that I think is several hours long. And when they say informed, they mean you have to be informed. Yeah. Mark, I'm sorry. Yeah. Right. Yes, you do have. At that point, you do have identifiable information. You can tell by you can you can I, I fingerprint the gate, potentially, right? That is, so 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 the pushback on this is, and this is what AOL learned when they anonymized their browsing data, and is that the difficulty with informed consent is that. You, you leave some data scientists think about this problem for a week or two, and then they come up with a way of fingerprinting people, and then they can track it back and, and, and synthesize that, that information that nobody knew, even the people who were going to collect it didn't know. So the only way you can, the informed consent can work is if you're committed to destroying the information you've collected after you've done, like, the project that you're going to do so that you can't think of other things to do with it. And, the fa and we don't do that. We figure, well, you know, it's valuable data. We're going to need it, you know, for something else later when we hang on to it. And Which that's, is precisely I think that's why a, I'm interested in the human side of that story. <laughs> so, so, so I think the crux of it is, is we don't destroy enough data. And, and what is very well, true about uh, informed consent is it's very fact dependent. There are thousands of court cases where informed consent has been thrown out because when the court matches the facts to what they were told, they don't always match. Uh, Mark. <laughs> uh, you, you learn a lot by going through that process, right? There's a training process that you have to go through. It makes you very aware of, of what you're actually doing when you're putting sensors out or in, involving human subjects. So I think the training is really valuable. And also, if you think in terms of Wild Wild West, IRBs are struggling to keep up with what it means to take data this way as well. So by partnering, you know, you, you have a, a back and forth that you can, that you can, I mean, you're entering into 
a relationship with your institutional review mm -hmm. board that, that actually helps them in their practice as well. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot to learn, even though it may add a layer to the process. I think it's a really valuable layer. Just a warning that it's slow. Yes. Well, again, uh, uh, it doesn't necessarily, I mean, it, mm -hmm. I mean, there is a, there's a re there is a really inter interesting tension here, which sort of joins what Scott says to kind of a lot, lot of this other stuff, which is what um, my sort of c colleague uh, Jonathan Strait would call epistemology on deadline, which is like just how can you get you know the best not how can you get the best knowledge information etc. published journalism published quickly. Obviously, as journalists, the words flying under the radar are like sort of, you know, immediately appealing. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, you know, so one of the arguments I make is this notion that I alluded to earlier, this notion that in, in the wild, wild west, uh, both as individuals and organizations, we need to get better at doing something in a new environment that we're not used to doing, which is having explicit ethical discussions, whether that's in the context of an individual versus a committee reviewing, you know, a research proposal, or whether that's a question about whether, you know, uh, a, t a team of database architects should be actually trying to solve a particular problem, you know, I mean, just the human or even profit-oriented motivation to actually solve that problem is a question in and of itself. And we're not used to having those. And there are ways in which we can all learn to get better at doing that, to your point. And, you know, the, we, in our breakout group, we talked yesterday about ways to learn how to collaborate better around frankly, what can be difficult and, you know, somewhat frightening and, and uh, you know, tough questions. Ethics is hard. It comes fraught with the potential for judgment, uh, for the fear of being wrong. And the better that we can be more explicit and transparent about how we're coming to that endeavor as a collective group of individuals, the better off we're going to be. And, and, and maybe, maybe kind of just to co connect the point to what Dave was saying about universities, if we get something out of this as, you know, the Tower Center, it's, the, it's what I'm hearing over and over again is you need a kind of clearing house for the conversations and the resources uh, for you know expertise that you know journalists can feel safe uh, asking at kind of you know rapid a trusted, rapid pace and yeah. so maybe you know the trusted environment which is 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 not going to be available to most newsrooms to um, you know have individually is something where kind of universities or Matt's department, our department, whatever, you know, kind of can, can start to kind of create some of those resource centers and have that conversation in public uh, so that everybody feels that, you know, they, they, they have a chance to shape it. Sorry, sorry, question. Oh, uh, okay. I've got one question here first and then, then there, yeah. So I want to change the topic of team, I want to talk about Tesla with time for a second. Oh. So when all that fun stuff happened, um, Nick Bilton, who's one of the technology reporters, had this very interesting tweet after Tesla released their data log saying, fascinating that with Tesla Gate, uh, Tesla Gate, people immediately trust the data over the human, even though the humans wrote the code that gathered the data. And I just thought it was really interesting how a lot of people, once the data just was released, it was automatically correct. Yes, even though it wasn't, oddly. Right. Yeah. I just, I just want to just bring that up, because like, I think we're talking about pure, a lot of like data now and kind of leaving like the journalism part behind, but like just the tensions those two, and if someone then releases data, like, do we just assume that's correct? Mm. Yeah, yeah. And I'll t I was going to say, I, I would add to that what Margaret Sullivan, the public editor, said, where she said the notebook on the front seat is no longer enough. You know, that if we're going to be tracked and monitored and measured as journalists, and that, like, Tesla is a really extreme example of that, but you can imagine everybody's conversation now as a journalist is recorded. You just have to accept that everything, you, all your interactions are recorded. So how do you, how do you? That's true as a citizen. I tell my students that if you really have something that you do not want a third party to know about, you get off your chair, you walk down the hall, you talk to the person first, face to face, and then you go back. You do not put it on email. You do not put it on a cell phone. The only way you can be sure that your, your conversation will go to the person you want to do wanted to go to and no further is A, if you know and trust the person, and if you do it face to face, like the spies who meet on a and park And don't take bench. your cell phone with you when you walk to That's go right. have a conversation. <laughs> right. 
Right. Okay. Really, that's the only way. But I, I think the Tesla point is, a, is, is an interesting one because there is, again, that it's a kick up in process and people believing the data, but isn't, isn't part of journalism also to have, to try and have that critical conversation quickly? I mean, it was interesting that, you know, again, it, it, it ran ahead of the publishing schedule of the newspaper of the Times and the conversation went into a much broader community. So but the counter, and the counterfactual. Did it end though, like, the, the interesting part was that it started with yep. whatever his article was, and then, but the, the like, output of Discourse continue to get smaller and smaller because, like, I, the public, Mark Sullivan's great blog. Like, how many people really read that? And it's just interesting that you. I think probably more. Re well, that would be an interesting question. Did more people read that than read uh, Elon Musk's original post on it? You know, it's kind or, of like. And, but, but also, they're probably two separate communities because back to the point that Rommel made that if people are kind of hanging, the, the Tesla enthusiasts wanted to believe that he had driven in circles around a car park to flatten the battery. Uh, whilst, indeed, whilst everybody else who, uh, John Broder, wanted everybody to know that he couldn't find the, the plug, the socket, and was driving around the car park in the dark because he couldn't find the socket. So it's, you know, it, but it, it's a good, good point. Yeah, it's, yeah, so what I would argue is that this is um, sort of Aristotelian uh, rhetoric. Um, <laughs> I love of, it when yes. he talks technical. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Um, which, it, which, which is that the most powerful argument, right, is the ethical argument, and the least powerful argument is the uh, is the logical argument. Um, and so, what has happened is that that ethos, the appeal to authority, used to be to the ancient masters or the gods or something like that. But now, in fact, data has the ethos. So, if you can figure out a way to work the data in, then you have a more powerful rhetorical argument. And it's really not about the, you know the data so much as, as, as classical rhetoric. That's why I'd like to answer your question about what would I do in the newsroom. <laughs> um, there's no such thing as a good technology or a bad technology. It's the human choice behind its use that makes it one or the other. So in the newsroom, I'm going to be dealing at the hiring stage. I want to hire somebody who wants to do the right things for the right reasons. Can I just bring up one last time? Really one. The, the interesting thing about what you said is thinking of like Tim Gross close and his whole point of that like bulge of people reporters just find the quotes that they want to find to support the point is you can now I think make a good argument that I can just find the data that supports my point and it's like that okay. that's that's the yeah that's, that's called academia. That's called <laughs> academia <laughs> indeed. or indeed life. Um, <laughs> sorry yes. Sure. So it seemed like to Joanne's point about how the legal system is reactive and can't get out ahead of these questions. I mean, I think that absolutely applies to the ethical and all the other dimensions. And I think about the case of Google Glass. I mean, we've been dealing with the implications of everyone having cameras for decades. And now all of a sudden, it's a camera on your face. And everyone sort of freaks out and has to start over. Um, and so I think you know where the Tau Center could come in is you need to have an ethical discussion about a new type of sensing the next week. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. And sort of these longer timelines, I just think, aren't going to work because, yeah. to his it's point about measuring there, steps actually. in a hallway, something that takes one data point about a step mm. maybe can't be used to measure someone's walking patterns, but something with two sensors can be used. Yeah. And so I, I think specificity is really important. But yeah. it's more than that because most people don't care about Google Glass. They probably can't afford it. They probably don't uh, know about it. And the example I will give is look what happened with the air traffic controllers a few weeks ago. When all of a sudden sequestration started to have effects, people do get in planes. It's a day-to-day -day activity, and man, that got dealt with in a week. And the reason why Congress is running around in circles with Google Glass is because they can't do other minor things like deal with the budget. So they're certainly not going to be dealing with Google Glass. It, there has to be pressure from the public. Yeah, and the other point I guess I would make is you cannot deal with it on a specific basis that narrowly. That is, the, the, the arbitrage that you can do around you know, coming up with a different kind of a device that isn't covered by a rule, like when, when you start talking about these things specifically, um, there are so many possible cases that, 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 that there's not enough paper in the world to print the legal code that you would need in order to deal with you the cases. The you need to have sort of a principle, right? So the kind of a principle like images are not allowed in a courtroom. First, right? do no harm. Right. You're not allowed to take pictures, period. doesn't matter what kind of camera you have. And then you hire artists to, to sketch in. You know, it used to work that way. Now, yes. apparently in Britain they haven't changed it, but 
that they have here. It, it still, I was going to say, it still works that way in Britain, where we have no written constitution, but you can't take a picture in a court. But you can <laughs> draw a badly rendered picture of someone in some really nasty pastels. Um, sorry, John. then I would say, it's better you don't participate. <coughs> That's it. I'm curious, did you guys talk about that possibility before you initiated the project? But you know, you've got to be reasonable here because the, the standard under the law is what would an ordinary, reasonable, prudent person do under the circumstances? So the reasonable thing for you is to let people know that what, what your data collection is going to do. You cannot know that that person had a restraining order. It is not possible for you to know that. And so it's that person's responsibility to let you know and make the decision. And once they do let you know, then you're responsible for saying, you know what, we're just not going to do it. So you can't presuppose, I mean, if a person has a restraining order out, they know that they're in danger in the first place, they should be thinking of that. You cannot put that in their head. Uh, we so close to being up to time, so if we, uh discussion yeah. here and then. I have uh, one quick question about more of the legal framework and how some of the existing precedents like um, uh, wiretapping laws and even things like trespassing and kind of this public-private um, boundary that we've discussed will affect our ability to implement some of these projects. And uh, with that in mind, it seems like a lot of the, the private sector is way far, uh, far out ahead of us. And as journalists, when do we start looking at people like Google and Facebook and all of these people who are already collecting lots of data and look at them as sources of data for us instead of making big investments in, in making our own sensor networks and what's their legal obligations or their framework for providing data to journalists? I mean, this is a kind of really interesting question, which is I've always felt because Facebook and Google and Twitter collect a lot of data that probably we have to get used to thinking about doing it ourselves. It's not, in, you know, how much, how much do you outsource of that kind of information flow? And that's well, the answer is there's no answer yet. And uh, let me tell you about wiretapping because it's illustrative of, of the problem. The first time we had a wiretapping statute was in the 1930s. Why? Because in the 1930s, people started getting phones, and we started dealing with warrants, and then there was uh, an electronic, I forget the name of the statute, but there was a statute that specifically addressed it. Okay, so the c concept of uh, a wiretap over time um, originally was in tandem with well, not a wiretap, but overhearing somebody's conversation was originally tied to a physical intrusion. If you were on the person's property as such that you can overhear what they're talking about, 
the trespass was an element of the wrong, so there had to be a trespass. Okay, so fast forward and the technology allows us to overhear conversations without being anywhere near the property. And so you have a whole line of cases where the concept of, um, of um, trespass just falls apart because the technology doesn't do that anymore and there's, there was discussions in the court about a spike mic. This was a mic that gets put into the wall. Well, is if you're on the wall, that's clearly a trespass. If you go inside the house, that's a trespass. But what about if it's just in the wall? Is that a physical intrusion that constitutes a trespass? And finally, at that point, the court said, this is not what we're doing. What we are protecting <laughs> here is we are protecting the conversation. Okay, and so there was a very famous cat case, US v. Katz, where the idea was we are protecting people, not places, and therefore uh, the interest to be protected was the conversation without regard to the physical elements of the wiretap. Fast forward to the late 1980s, and now you have a case with a satellite, and a satellite is being used to monitor the Dow chemical company in uh, Midland, Michigan. Long story short, um, the court, want, it was a, a warrantless search and the court wanted to uphold that search because at that point in the history of the court, they were not going to do anything that weakened um, search and seizure because of the drug war that was going on in the late 80s. And so they upheld this case with the satellite and um, they went back to trespass again because that's the conceptual hook that they needed. So what happens is that the, the decisions change based on the elements of the technology. And the court said something they didn't even have to say. They said, well, you know, uh, the, the search that we are upholding today was on an airplane, and that's a technology that everybody has access to. I would take issue with that. But, uh, uh, but if the search was a satellite, we might have to do something different. They didn't even have to bring it in, and they did because they needed some technology to distinguish what they wanted to do. So with weird stuff now, like cyberspace and everything else, they're just beginning to conceptualize this stuff. You're looking in the wrong place for the data. You can buy that data from other people who sell data, right? So I, I'd argue, you know, you go to CoreLogic, you go to ADP, you can buy data, which is more about financial stuff, and, you know, so for stories around the follow the money kind of a thing. A uh, couple companies back, we, we did that. We got the CoreLogic data, we got another data set. Um, both of which, had, so core, it, it, one was uh, mortgage-backed security data that had all of this anonymized mortgage data, <laughs> and then this other one was uh, was uh, credit scores, which had all these anonymized credit scores, and uh, by doing sophisticated analyses, you could identify people who had gotten second mortgages fraudulently, and you could identify the individual. Um, so we, you know, we came up with what percentage of second mortgages were fraudulently obtained, uh, and we. Not being journalists, we didn't publish their names. Um, but you did sell it for a profit. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, that's, that's why, you, that, that was your human motivation, right? Um, so, but what I'm saying is, is, is you, you, you're looking for things, the kind of data that Google or you know, Facebook collect is one class of information, but there's a lot of some information that you can buy from people who are more than happy to sell it to you, where there are all kinds of really great stories that can be, uh, can you know, be and the created. Really, the bigger question underlying this whole conversation is we may very well be at a point in our history where our cultural values toward the concept of privacy are undergoing sea changes. This is, and I have a resource around that. So there's an organization out there that's started by a couple of um, law professors at Michigan State University, um, Daniel Katz and uh, a woman named Renee Kanaki. Which is K N A K E, and um, they uh, started an organization called Reinvent Law, and they're really exploring in great detail in, in collaboration and partnership with technologists um, and business folks. Really, um, so there's a, a course. So they had their first conference last fall in Silicon Valley. They had 40 speakers on sort of both sides of the question, and then you know the, those. 
those two worlds aren't going to be that separate, you know, I think in the future in some way. And they developed a course in partnership with the Michigan State University Broad School of Business that explicitly, I think the title is Law, Ethics, and Our you know, Future or something like that. And that's part of what that curriculum is going to explore for you folks that are interested in tactical, real world best practices and, and how those worlds are you know, going to start to come together and, and how they're going to influence each other for the future. Okay, um, that was a great discussion. Thank you very much indeed. Thank, thank you as well for um, feeding into that. It's